Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is financial advisor Jody Lynn Craven. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Indeed we are, and we're right, also we joined by uh, a major league pitcher. Well, a former major league pitcher. We don't we, we don't get major league pitchers on here very often, Jody. Uh, like, never? <laughs> no, I've... I, I was going to say I've never met a major league pitcher or mm -hmm. baseball player, but that's a lie. I did once. I met oh, you Jose did. Batista in a bar. Oh, you did? No kidding. I did. Okay. Yep. Well, they cool. weren't supposed to be out that night, so they were all like, you know, trying to be well, yeah, not shady. Undercover sort of, yeah. Right. Undercover. And all yeah. of my friends were like, oh, my God, that's Jose <laughs> Batista. And I, I'm like, cool. And I just walked over there and was like, can you show my hat? <laughs> Yeah, there you go. That's the way to do yeah. it. Absolutely. Well, yes. our, our guest also has a lot more that has gone on in his life. He has been, it has been an eventful life to say the least. And it is also, it, it, it's, I, I don't say this in any way to undermine what his, his story is because it's such a great story, but it's the kind of story we've heard a lot. People have this stuff going on and then there's a huge crash and then there's a flying up from it at the end. And it's no less true for our guest today. Um, his name is Brandon Puffer. Brandon is a former major league pitcher. Um, he is the author of an upcoming book called From the Bullpen to the State Pen. And that'll give you a little tiny bit of a clue about what that crash is all about. I'm not gonna tell the story, I'm gonna let him do it. So Brandon, first of all, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, How you thank doing you all, today? yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, absolutely. And uh, tell us a little bit uh, about the major league career. I mean, you, you were telling me before the show, but uh, who'd you pitch for? Yeah, absolutely. So the major league career in itself is a little brief. A couple cups of coffee, uh, parts of four <laughs> years with um, the Houston Astros, the San Diego Padres, San Francisco Giants. And then I was on the roster with the Boston Red Sox. Happened to be on there at just the right time when they won their first World Series, but didn't actually pitch for them. So it's kind of an interesting story in itself. And then, you know, I played 15 years professionally. So the rest of it was minor league stops and just kind of all over the place, small towns, several different organizations and just a really fun journey. And that's a story all by itself because the life of yeah. a minor leaguer is just insane. I mean, just because, yeah. because you're playing purely for the love of it. It's not like there's no money. There's, there's any money in it. There's no money Very for true. minor leaguers. It's just, it's, they're, they're actually paid below minimum wage. If you can imagine that. Wow. But, I can um, imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you can. Yeah. yeah. No, it, well, it's because yeah. baseball back in 1922 got an exemption on, on antitrust. And they, they use that exemption to do things like violate mi minimum wage laws. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, it's not going to last forever. There's already uh, stuff going on, yeah. uh, both with the uh, the Baseball Players Union and, and Major League Baseball itself. So there, there are changes afoot, but they've been slow in coming. And uh, I'm glad that they are coming. But that's not really the heart of the story today. And, and th this is the tough part. But you got to tell us what happened toward the end of that career and uh, what i mean it was quite a happening yeah of course and, and and you know i think the baseball career maybe just gives a little bit of a platform just to help me share with you know guys i coach or mentor or whatnot but yeah like you said walt i mean it definitely isn't the, the it was the highlight and it was the thing that i thought growing up would would make my life complete and mm. kind of give me that ultimate peace and joy if i just became a big league ball player and what I found, and you've heard this in, in multiple different folks who've had a small slice of success or achieving a dream, is it didn't really provide that. Uh, mm. There was still kind of a hole inside of me that I was trying to fill with a bunch of different things off the field. And, um, you know, for me, a lot of that coming from an addiction background, had a father that struggled with addiction. It was alcohol and it was, you know, a little bit of drugs and just kind of promiscuity and the, the baseball life of kind of being out and, and um I guess for lack of a better term, taking advantage of all that came with that and, and, and not in a positive way. So not only was it detrimental to my career and taking care of myself, but also harmful just to others around me. I mean, just being a kind of a selfish type of person. And, and I guess we feel a little bit bulletproof when you're going through that period of time where you're a quote unquote professional athlete. And so I, I did. I didn't handle that very well, especially off the field and just kind of what was just having fun and partying with guys off the field became a real issue for me really pretty early on. And like I said, I played 15 years, so I had enough time to try to figure this out and some kind of minor setbacks and things of that nature. But the part you're alluding to that really became my rock bottom and my crash was um, in 2008, 
I was playing in Frisco, Texas. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen the movie Bull Durham, but oh, I was yeah. kind of Crash Davis. I had made it to the big leagues. Jody, you got to see it. And, um, you know, I had had a little bit of time, a little bit of experience there, but I was an older guy around 30, 30 plus at this time for double A. That's that's really old. Yeah. <laughs> Just for a human, not so old, but for double A, you're old. And when you're double so, A. Yeah, that's almost amazing that you're still in the, the organization yeah. actually at that age. Yeah, well, and that's why the Texas Rangers, that was the affiliate, brought me on in that role. It was kind of like, hey, your, your days are getting pretty numbered, but we think you'd be a good coach in professional mm -hmm. baseball. We've got this young set of guys in Frisco. Um, some of the names that stand out, I remember like Chris Davis and Elvis mm -hmm. Andrews and just mm -hmm. really guys who ended up being big name um, professionals, big leaders. And so they were young. They were 17 then to 19 years old. And it was like, hey, let's go down and you'll be kind of a mentor to them. Again, the premise of Bull Durham. So mm -hmm. I was thrilled to do it. It was a great role. I enjoyed it. Um, at this time, I was not only considered a mentor of those guys, but I was their FCA leader. I was all these different things that they looked up to. And when you're in that position, or at least for me, when I was in that position, I didn't want them to know that I didn't have it all going on. I, didn't, I mm. want them to think I was perfect and I was the best family guy. And I, you know, just because they, they did look up to me, I didn't want to let them down. But the truth was I was struggling the whole time. I was still, some of those old habits were sneaking up on me. I was making poor choices, but just not going out with them, but kind of living a double life, basically. Mm. And um, it would really catch up with me in the form of they would just keep picking at me to go out with them, right? Because I was the old guy and they were young and having the time of their life. And I had been there before. And, you know, I had maybe even had a reputation for being kind of fun when I went out. And I said, well, guys, that, that's all fun and games. But at this point in my life, it, that's not for me. I, I can't do it. You know, I, I can ruin my life in one night is the quote that sticks with me um, because I would essentially prove that. Um, September 13th, we were going into the ballpark. Again, Frisco, Texas, we're in a championship series. And, um, you know, I'm just driving in and having kind of that internal dialogue. Um, you know what? Maybe I'll just go out the guys tonight. It's Friday. We're, I'm going to be back home next week, back to the family schedule. Just go kind of cut loose and have some fun. And I think anyone listening, or at least some people listening, can kind of relate and be like, I've been there where it's like, eh, one night, one compromise, no big deal, right? And, and to be honest with you, that internal dialogue kind of took on more size of its own in, in the form of like, yeah, not a good idea. You probably shouldn't, but I'd already made up my mind, right? We have the choice. To so see, you to have the two voices. You have the, the good voice and the bad voice and all that kind of thing. Honestly, I did. Yeah, I really, mm -hmm. really did. And the good voice was just me and my selfish ambitions, or excuse me, the bad voice. The good voice was was my faith and saying, hey, you know what's good for you. You know, this isn't the right path for you. And um, but at the end of the day, we have a choice to make. And I chose, I was going to go out with the guys. And so ignored the small voice. I went out with the guys. Again, I've been playing 15 years at this point. Very normal day. Go do your routine, play the game, go out with the guys, wake up and do it again, right? Except for September 14th when I woke up, um, it was quite different. It was me surrounded by a bunch of others in the same concrete room as me wearing an orange jumpsuit. Um, I know I don't, everyone at this point knows where I was, but it was like a movie. I mean, I'd only seen this on a movie. I woke up, don't remember the night, I'm in jail. Um, a guy who was our clubhouse manager came to pick me up and bail me out because I had called him, but I didn't remember that. And I said, man, what happened? What is going on? He said, I don't know. You just called me. And I luckily, I thought you were kidding, but I came down here just to see, and here you are. So what had happened is I had, you know, again, it, it was just one night. It was just one choice. But in the thoughts and the process leading up to that of just thinking, you know, we can kind of go out and do it, everyone, have fun and party and have all these things that are, I just had a really just a base mindset of, um, you know what? Yeah, we can go out and live it up. And so I committed a felony and I don't know who all your listeners are. I'm always kind of sensitive to the, the actual details, although I'm open book about it, but essentially I had walked in an apartment uninvited from a young lady that I had met the year previous. My family had stayed in that apartment. And in my mind, or at least what they told me was I kept saying, Hey, I've got a friend here and she's probably having a party and I'm just going to go see what they're doing. Couldn't turn my motor off. It's three in the morning. They're saying, just go to bed, buff. Just go to bed. And at the end of the day, they're like, well, we're going to bed. You're a grown man. And I made that poor choice to leave the apartment, knocked on the door to see if my friend was having a party. Clearly was not. The door was unlocked. I walked in. So burglary of a habitation. And then I tried to get in bed with her. And that's very embarrassing to admit. And even the look on Jody's face is like, oh, my goodness. But it's part of my story. And it's just part of where I was at that time and how I was living and what somehow in my mind thought, well, sure, this is acceptable, right? The thing I do remember and will never forget 
is that had frightened her, obviously. Here's a strange man that she didn't know who it was. I mean, she knew me, but she didn't know it was me, saying, here you are in my apartment at 3 in the morning. I remember the scream like it was yesterday. And that was a sobering moment. Um, again, there's there's not only a victim in this crime, but my family and all the people that were affected by this choice. Um, and so, yeah, burglary of a habitation with intent to commit another felony. That other felony was sexual assault, which is, again, just embarrassing and I mean, even saying the words, but I try to be as transparent as I can be just to try to help maybe just one person who's kind of thinking along these lines or going, hey, I've been in a similar situation or, you know, the next time they have that opportunity, especially the kids I coach, like, hey, guys, this was one night. Look what it turned into. And so not only was I in jail that next day, I, I got out that day on bond, um, pitched that night, the season ended, went and just kind of thought, you know what, I'm not telling anybody about this. I'm going to hide and stuff this thing down and as we know most of the things that happen in the dark they get spoken about in the light and um a couple weeks after i was home the media guy from frisco the rough riders you know called me and he said hey bud um did you get in some trouble the last weekend you were here and i said oh yeah yeah no big you know whatever and he said well i just wanted you to know that a media outlet reached out to me uh, they caught wind of it and if they're reaching out to me they're probably going to run a story which means a lot of people will so here we go Time to face reality. Um, yes, you made a mistake, a very boneheaded knucklehead mistake, and others were affected by it. But now it's not a slap on the wrist. It's not, ah, oh, this will go away. Baseball will take care of it and all those kind of things. It's You're going to face this. And so I went to a jury trial about nine months later. Obviously, baseball went to the back burner. I, I had some teams calling, and I said, look, I don't know what my fate is. I don't. And um, I was facing five to 99 years. Um, I didn't look at, yeah, I didn't look at the internet very much at the time because I just was trying to really just stay by family and just, you know, get my life turned around. But one time I clicked it on, I saw that headline, former Astros pitcher faces five to 99 years. And I didn't even know that. I was still just oblivious um, to this deal. And so I went to that, that trial and I ended up getting five years in prison, um, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, uh, very surreal, even just the three days leading up to that. Um, when they took me off, as soon as they read that sentence, um, they, the bailiffs came and handcuffed me. My dad was there. I said, can I go hug my dad goodbye? They said, nope, you know, you're ours now. And so just very real, very fast. And I went back and they stripped me, put me in the clothes I'd be wearing and they closed the bars and I just can hear the clank like it was yesterday. And I started doing the math on my children's, um, ages. Where will, how old will they be in five years? Oh my goodness, this all set in in a very, very real way. And I, I called myself a Christian at the time. I don't know what anyone's faith is here, but for me, that that was my mom is a pastor. I grew up knowing what was wrong and right and, and what we believed in our faith. And I had, I had called myself that, but at this point in time, I really just surrendered everything and said, look, this is where I got myself. I mean, my own choices, my own selfishness, all those things got me landed right here in an eight by 10 cell disappointed everybody, let everybody down because I didn't want to let them down and tell them I was messed up and needed some help. And I would go on to do that. But when I made that surrender decision, it was the oddest thing because we talked about being able to pitch in the big leagues. And I've got great stories of my debut. The Red Sox gave me a World Series ring that year I was with them. I mean, all these really cool baseball things that never, as I said, gave me that good piece. But once I surrendered and just said, look, I'm open, I'll use this for whatever good I can. And, and fast forward and getting to share it on, you know, with folks like you as part of that, if maybe just one person gets helped. And basically um, what I found is in there as a janitor, as a, you know, seeing some horrible things, obviously, and missing my family. That's the really the part that's really tough about being incarcerated, but it's supposed to be tough. It's supposed to get your attention. And it was, um, but I had, I had a joy and a peace, not just a joy, like get me out of here, but Hey, I'm going to walk this out and just be joyful and 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 have peace through this trying time and i did and so moving forward when i would get out and things would be redeemed and it was a slow process you know i had to really humble myself and kind of take on some some humbling jobs and and relationships needed to be mended and things of that nature um but everything just got completely redeemed and then some and it was just because of that attitude of just being grateful for like okay i'm gonna walk this out and uh, i'm not gonna keep praying get me out of here I'm going to just keep praying, show me what you need me to do while I'm in here. And there's a lot of cool stories that'll be in my book of, you know, inmates that had triple life sentences that I got to kind of encourage. And 
Um, one in particular said he was going to commit suicide the night before I, I got in his cell. And so just being able to share some encouragement to some folks that honestly, Jody and Walt, I, I just thought were just bad people. Like, you know what? Lock them up. Don't wait. I don't know anything about jail. I've never been. Um, but as I think right now, there's really good men in there and women that made a really poor choice. And they're actually very talented, very smart in some cases and very, um, very good people, with good hearts. And I'm fortunate to be out and on the other side of this. A lot of them, because of those choices, will never get that opportunity. So I apologize for being so long-winded. I'm sure there's a lot of questions, but that's kind of the no, yeah, not at all. The, the gist of the rock bottom, the from the peak or you know the, the major league bullpen to literally the state pen for three and a half years. And so that's, right, yeah, that, yeah. that's wow. that's quite the story. Uh, <laughs> I I, I want to go to uh, not to belabor, but I really want to go back to that point where, like you described it, the the doors clang shut. You realize what your situation was and you surrendered. I think it was the word you used. Yes. That's, yeah. that's not always the response. Sure. There are lots of different possible responses. Why do you think you made that one? You know, I think because, because of my upbringing, you know what I mean? Like, I just think I was fortunate to have a great support system and, you know, a mom and a dad that, you know, like I said, dad had his issues. He, he mm -hmm. was a, I always wanted to be like my dad. He's my hero. Still is. Always was. Real big guy. He was a good athlete. Didn't turn down a fight. You know, that kind of thing. I'm like, that's a man. Mm -hmm. My mom in the early years was like just an angel. I mean, literally just gave her whole life to the church, served us, made sure the family, you know, was the glue. And I actually kind of resented it. It was like, oh, this is kind of too much for me just because mm -hmm. I didn't know her any different. Well, then my dad changed his life, got sober through Celebrate Recovery gave his life to the Lord and just, I watched him change and I go, okay, this is real. I, I watched him walk there. I always encourage parents and myself and anyone going, it's like, we can say a lot, but they're going to watch what you do. And when I watched my dad make that change, it was huge. So fast forward to that moment. I had always been told like, look, when, when he's all you have, you'll realize is all you need. And that was the first time I was like, this is all I have. And that's the only way I knew what to turn to. And I know okay. for some that's like, eh, that's not me or that doesn't, and that's okay. But with my upbringing and, and what had been poured into me, I knew it was like, they're right. This is it. And so I walked through that whole time with constant prayer and conversation and reading and just kind of trying to better myself. And um, it was the most, I don't want to say it's the most peaceful time of my life. That's, But I did find a lot of peace in a very chaotic place. I'll tell you that. Which is an, a, a major accomplishment all by itself. That yeah. truly is. Yeah. Um, now you also mentioned your mom, how yeah. I, th I think the way you said it, in her, in your early years, she was the angel, the glue that held the family together. Yeah. But you also hinted there was a change after that. Talk about what happened after. After. I don't know what, after what is. I mean, you, you just hinted that that was the early years and there's something oh. that happened later on. Well, no. So with my mom, no, she, she continued to be that. She did. Uh, okay. She did. She did. So she is a pastor at Saddleback Church in California. Um, pastor Rick Warren's most noted for writing The Purpose Driven Life. Um, okay. Pretty big, mega. Country, Love that anyway, yeah. You like, you have it? You like it? Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's amazing. I have it too. And so she, no, well, she never wavered, man. She, it okay. was when my dad changed and went from this rough character to kind of taking on the faith and uh, it, no doubt my mom had a lot to do with that because it was like at some point she's like, you're going to lose me and your boys if you don't get this together. Mm. Um, but just a strong woman to, to kind of put down that ultimatum and go, look, we're not playing anymore. Um, but no, she continued that to this day. I mean, she's wow. that she serves every single day. And like it's nothing for her to be at the bedside of loved ones as someone passes away or just every day. And that's she's a servant heart and that's her life. And and it's amazing. And so she was the first female pastor to be ordained by Pastor Rick and the Southern Baptist had a little issue with it. I was like, wow, you're such a troublemaker. <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> the church trouble. But um, just as a joke, because she's just she really is just a, a very incredible human being. Mm -hmm. Brandon, I, I just have to um, acknowledge uh, your bravery in speaking about this so openly. And I want to use the word bravery because I think, uh, you know, myself included, you hear different stories and typically we'll hear it from the, the victim's point of view. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of stuff to be said there. And what I, I love the way that you put that this was a mistake. 
and that you were able to forgive yourself and move forward from it. Because a lot of times in that specific situation, especially with like sexual assault or allegations or, or whatever, right? All of that stuff, typically we put the men in that scenario into a box and say that they're bad and, and never give them another chance. And uh, it's just so beautiful that you were able to forgive yourself and then speak about it openly like this, which I think will give other people the opportunity or the courage to maybe start forgiving themselves for some of the th these things that they've done in the past, whether it's something related to this or something different. That's wow. Thank you. Just, wow. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, obviously it's not easy to do. And I've had, you know, like my agent in my playing career was like, well, let's just kind of bury this and even pay to get it buried further and move on and go back to your baseball life. And, I just knew from that time of like, no, this is something that hopefully I'm going to use to help others. And I know alcoholism and, and even, um, you know, like drug addiction and especially mental health is very, very talked about. It's very at the forefront, but like the, the sexual stuff, the promiscuity, the, the it's, it's, it kind of just gets swept under the rug. And I know that was a big issue for me. And I had plenty of time when I was gone three and a half years to really take a deep dive and go, yes, the alcohol was a huge problem. But the way I lived my life prior to that also played into these choices when I was, you know, whether I was blacked out or whatever the case may be, I was 100% responsible for what happened. And that kind of stems from all that. So just being aware of your thoughts and what you're putting in there kind of tends to come out. So I appreciate you saying that. And um, it's gotten a little bit easier as time went on. In the beginning, there's still, you know, shame and, and, and things of that nature that you have to deal with on a daily on a daily basis. Um, especially in the beginning, it was kind of like, is everybody looking at me? Does everybody know what I did? You know, just, and now just getting it out there and, and being encouraged by others, like such as yourself just now, and, and hopefully encouraging others, it's become more of, okay, let's, let's take away a little of this, this, um, having this hold on you and give it less power by, by getting it out there and using it for good. Mm hmm yeah. And not letting that one mistake, mistake define who you are on a soul level or on the level of your heart. You know, you did something bad. It doesn't mean that you are bad. And that's a, a huge differentiation that I think a lot of people miss. And that's why it's so difficult to forgive themselves. That's huge. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's that's spot on. And I think being in there and now having a heart for many, many men in that same situation um, maybe made different choices. And 99% of the time they were impaired, you know, their mind was impaired with drugs or alcohol. But at the end of the day, it was just like, you see them in their best form and not everybody goes and chooses to reform. I mean, there's certainly a lot of them just kind of acting up and with, that's yeah. what they want to do. But the ones who did, you got to know them. I was just astonished at, you know, the, the people and the ingenuity and the, what they did prior. And they're just like, wow, there's some really great folks here. So gave me a heart for people even now here on the other side of this, um, in the world, they're a little down on their luck rather than just saying, oh, they just, they screw up. You know, it's like, no, I don't know the circumstances, you know. It does give us a, a different perspective on things because we do tend to think in terms of, well, this is the way that stuff is structured. So we will always evaluate everything this way. Yes. And, and when you start looking beneath the surface, you find things that aren't really harmonious with that idea. They kind of fight it. They kind of resist it. They kind of make a lie out of it, which is confusing. Sure. Let's be honest. That's very, very confusing because we, we live by our paradigms. Our paradigms are how we make sense out of the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And when, when the paradigms get turned upside down on their ear, well, is that really upside down? Kind of a mixed metaphor there. But when, <laughs> when, when they get flipped around, yeah, that, that throws us. That's yes. not easy. But that's mm -hmm. also where the biggest growth takes place. That's, that was going to be my exact thought is, is it isn't easy, but that's to your point. Growth only happens in times of adversity or where you really need to dig down deep and go, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was. And and even in the case of, of mine, you know, I thought I kind of had my whole life mapped out. The Rangers were grooming me to be a coach. I wanted to be a big league bullpen coach. I'm going to stay in this professional lifestyle forever. And there was just that all got flipped up, you know, upside down. And um, but then it's like, OK, well, now let's really take a bit. Maybe there's something bigger for me that I didn't even think about. And, um, you know, I mentioned I had the youth and high school program here in Texas for, mm. um, you know, young, aspiring baseball players. I would have never kind of saw that in my future or down, you know, part of my path. And it gives me more 
um, joy, more happiness. I'm more proud of what they're doing than, than I ever got playing. Cause when he was playing for me, it was always just the next outing and the next thing. And yeah, that was good, but I got to just keep being on, you know, it just was never, and maybe it's just me and the way I approached it, my mentality, I didn't allow myself to enjoy it as much as maybe I could have, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, what the doors that open, you know, since that time. And I think the important part to realize is, is it, you know, it was important for me to, to be able to own up to that and, and go, Hey, you know, you got, you needed some humility and you got it, but now you need to keep it. And so I think that's going to remain a very important thing for me moving forward as well. When I get further removed from these consequences and things are going well. And I've, again, I've been redeemed to my children and to, you know, the job world and baseball and just all kinds of things that I could have never imagined sitting in, in that cell thinking, I'll just be happy to have freedom again, let mm-hmm. alone thrive in life. Um, but yeah, the further along you get, right, you, you still need that reminder of, hey, don't, you know, don't forget where you came from. Don't dwell on it and don't don't stay there because, you know, to Jody's point, you can move past that and still, you know, gain a certain amount of respect and success and things of that nature. But don't forget how quickly you could you could slip and go right back down that road. So that dichotomy of kind of thought of like letting it go and moving forward, but also not forgetting it is mm-hmm. what I, I try to keep up daily. And what a great like superpower that you now have for the people that are around you, whether you're coaching them or your own children or whatever, like you have this wonderful example of how you, you know, went through something really, really difficult, went to jail and came out the other side feeling more peace and more joy and, you know, learning all of these things about yourself and, and how, like, even just the example of how quickly one decision can change the trajectory of your life. And you could have at that moment just said, you know, screw it. I'm a loser. And I'm I'm just gonna, you know, whatever, whatever happens in jail, I've never been in jail before, but you, you know, like you could have went the opposite direction, but you didn't. And that's so inspiring, Brandon. Thank you, Joy. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. And it, it is, those are voices that definitely have to fight. I mean, you know, not only, especially when it was fresh, you're going through it, but even moving forward, this stays with me, you know, I mean, uh, it's, you know, I'm a convicted felon and, and I, I do have to continue to check in and things of that nature. And so those are voices that you do have to fight. And then it's just perspective of, of, I like to say, you know, and tell my guys, it's like, talk to yourself more than you listen to yourself. I need to keep telling myself who I really am and, and what I'm about and, and you know, all those things rather than, cause if I start listening, it's like, Oh yeah, you're this and you did that. And you went here and you know, yada, yada, yada. And so, yeah, it's, it is, it's, it's an important message. And I, I hope I don't sound like I have it all together because it's a work in progress every day, but it did teach me a lot. I guess the school of hard knocks taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. Very hard knocks. Yeah. Yes. I, you mentioned uh, the movie Bull Durham earlier yeah. too, which was a yeah. great movie, you know, Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon, yes. Tim Robbins. Yeah. It was quite quite seminal for many people. It also introduced people to a term that the public didn't really know about, but Kevin Costner introduced to the public awareness the term the show. The show yeah, meaning so. getting to the major leagues because the major yeah. leagues is where it's at. That's the show. Right. And I thought it was really fascinating how you described you got to the major leagues, you got to the show, and it didn't fill your heart. That's fascinating. Yeah, you know, it is. And like I said, well, I mean, from the time I was a little boy, I wrote this out on paper. My parents still have it. I said, I will be a big league ball player. No one can tell me different. It was that like passionately. I'm going to yeah. do it. I'm gonna, um, but I did. I, and I also thought, of, yeah, if I just got one day in the big leagues, then my life, that's what I was here for. And, and so I think that's what it is. Like, OK, maybe. And it's not that I'm not proud of it or there's not some really cool stories and memories, you know, through that time. And my family enjoyed it and all that good stuff. But um but yeah, it wasn't the, okay, this is my purpose. I was supposed to be here and be a ball player. And cause again, in order to, I mean, you're either, you know, part of your routine of working out or preparing for your next outing or at the field or your next, I mean, it just doesn't lend itself to, to being a very um, serving individual. And some guys do a great job. I mean, I play with guys. I'm like, how do they do it? Their family life's great. They serve others. They do community work. They, and they perform on the field. I was always a nervous wreck. Just am I going to be prepared enough for my next outing? And then when that was over, let's go to the next one. So, yeah, uh, yeah the show is a – I mean, all he said about the the baseballs being white, and I think he had some other terms I'm not going to share about mm-hmm. when the show. Mm-hmm. Um, all that's true. And all that was was really cool analogy, and the guys in the bus are back there eating it up, like what's right. going to be like when we get there. I mean, 
please don't mishear me for anyone dreaming of that or the guys that are there now. It's like, it's awesome. It's amazing. And, and I'm super proud and all that. But then at the end of the day, you go, okay, up until that point, baseball was who I was, period. And now it's it's something I did, but not who I am. So I had to. I had That's to a big difference. That's a yeah. huge difference right there. Yes. There, there's it, it's one that yeah. can take quite a bit of time and or experience or and or hard knocks yeah. to get that difference yeah. but once you get it that's life-changing i i would actually say i would attribute that to why you made your shift you made your change when that that door clang shut wow. that you you recognize the difference between yeah. being yourself and being a baseball player yeah, that, that was that was huge. That was big, big part of what transpired when when all that took place. Because, and then I went through. You know what? I don't even deserve to be a part of baseball anymore. Forget it. You know, and I have a journal I kept. I was in there, so I'll read pages mm. now and just go, "Wow, okay." And at, th at this point in time, I was thinking, "No way." And then there are some days where I allowed myself to dream and go, "Well, maybe." You know, who knows? If I get back on track, this could happen or that could happen. And so it's fun to look back at that, and I'll have like entries and stuff in the book and all that. Uh, so that is neat to be able to go back and and kind of draw where my mindset was and when and and then some points like hey this was what was really helping me through that trying time and and so that's a neat thing but I agree with you I mean and I go through it now because I, you know we're fortunate we have some very talented young men in our program we've had a couple mm -hmm. first round picks we've had you know guys going to some of the big schools and walking through that with the families and the parents you can see this like oh, it's all about this right now. Um, and my parents would tell you the same thing, like, you know, my mom being a big pastor at the church and my dad, I mean, it was always like, how's Brandon doing? How's baseball? How's this? Uh -huh. How's that? And everyone was just proud in the hometown. Well, then when this happened and they'll tell you this, it's like, oh, please don't ask me how Brandon's doing. You yeah. know, it can change very quickly when you're so mm -hmm. proud and you're the proud parent. Right. Um, I mean, to their credit, they didn't waver one bit in their lo unconditional love. But you can see where that that changes things. Sure. Really how could it not? Our son, the, the, the pro ball player, as opposed to, oh, well, not so good right now, actually. Mm. So, But again, my mom has had an opportunity to minister to so many parents going through the same thing. So um, it's just great to see when something's supposed to go so bad. And, and I, what I take away, you know, again, just the victim part of it and not, you know, um, making someone feel unsafe. And I mean, I'm, I'm a good guy. I'm an encouraging guy. I hate that I did that to somebody. So I would take that part away 1,000%. But I wouldn't take away the rest that has come and just the ability for, you know, my mom to help folks, for me to help folks. And it's it's pretty common for high school coaches someone in the area to go, hey, we've got a kid kind of going through it and making some choices. Do you mind meeting with them? So things, things like that are where I'm going, OK, well, now that we've been through it and for everyone who's been through anything trying, whether they brought it on themselves like I did or they didn't, usually those are the folks who are going to help people right in that same situation when that time comes. Right. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's what they're familiar with the most, and that's what they yeah. feel like they're expert at, which Absolutely. is true. It's very, it's a, it's a valid yeah. conclusion. One, one of the things that keeps going through my mind as we're talking about this is you had to go through your own growth before you could have help somebody else. We, this has been a theme lately, a lot on the show. You can't help somebody else until you have something to give them. Sure. And you had to have that thing to give them. And, and probably the most important thing was recognizing your true self identity. And then deciding what you want to do with that identity of that. This is the real me. The baseball player wasn't the real me. The person growing up wasn't even the real me. This is the real me. Yeah. What, what, when you thought about who the real you was, let, not so much then perhaps because your, your, your thoughts were probably still kind of seminal at that point. But now yeah. when you think about the real you, who do you think the real you is now? That's a great question. That's a really great question. I, I think... The real me is someone who really does like to encourage. I consider myself an encourager. Mm -hmm. um, I really love to come along someone, whether I'm at the gym or I'm coaching or whatever the case may be. And just whether it's a smile or a kind word or just I love encouraging people. I love it. And I think that was always in there. But when you're always pursuing your own self gain, and in my case, you know, the, the career specifically, um, you just don't, you don't get outside of yourself or I didn't, I should say, get outside of myself enough to really pour into that gift. I think it's a gift actually. And I love doing it. And so, um, I, and then I had so much time on my hands that let to your point, I had to make the choice that I wanted to be better, but I poured into books and I poured into cognitive intervention classes that were offered. And um, in fact, th that was one of the best classes I ever took in my life to kind of learn more about 
the thoughts and why, like why these actions? And um, it was a three month course. And when I graduated, the teacher was like, I think you're eating this up. They want me to let fresh people in because we have a we have a line. There's a waiting list. Do you want to do it again? And I said, heck yeah. And we did that three times. So <laughs> nine months, I was in a three month class just going, wow. yes. And finally, she's like, they're not going to let me let you do it again. <laughs> but I think I never slowed down long enough to, to do that. I mean, I never when I first went away for like a week, I, I always tell people this. I would reach down off my bunk like I was grabbing a cell phone. I don't have a cell phone now. <laughs> I won't for the next few years. So all of a sudden, you know, you have the time mm. to really figure out, you know, like you said, who are you? What is it you want to do? What are your gifts? And what does that look like? And so um, I, I started there. I just started pouring into books and, and taking the classes and then trying to implement those things while I was behind bars. Not like, okay, I'll wait till I get out, keep to myself here. I really tried to be an encourager while I was in there. And, and in some cases I got feedback where it was, it was helpful. So that was huge. Yeah, the feedback, because that's, that no matter where you are, feedback is where the world feeds back to us what we're putting out. Yes. And it's valuable for that reason, because when when you recognize what the feedback is telling you about your well, about what you're putting out, first of all, it empowers you to where you want to make the change to actually make the change. Yeah. And it also empowers you where you don't feel like you need to make the change because you feel good about yourself to feel good about yourself. Yes. I mean, it kind of works both it's ways both in that good. sense. Yes, I agree. And, and the reason, part of the reason I mentioned this, uh, you were mentioning earlier about alcohol and drug addiction, various yeah. kinds of addictions and so forth. My wife has a, a background in psychotherapy. Um, and Louise has told me numerous times her belief system, particularly from when she was a therapist, about why people get involved in drugs. Because she was a drug and alcohol counselor. That, that was what she did, substance abuse. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and, and I would ask her, what is addiction from your perspective? And she'd give me her definition. And I'd say, why do people become addicted? And the one answer she gives me most constantly, of course, the answer is always a little bit different every time. But the one consistent part of the answer almost every time is it's about masking pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I agree 100% um, just in my experience, speaking mm -hmm. for me, and then in just the experience of folks I've met through recovery. Recovery has been a big part of our family's life. Like I said, um, it's actually a Celebrate Recovery is a faith-based AA, basically. Mm -hmm. And it started at Saddleback Church, where I mentioned my parents went. And my dad was one of the first people to go through the program. Uh, a guy by the name of John Baker started it uh, along with Pastor Rick Warren. And literally, my, my dad explains it was like a folding table with a few chairs. And now it's a huge, had the honor of speaking there last week. I went back wow. to visit my parents. And I mean, it's a full deal now to celebrate recovery meetings. And, they, and they're and they everywhere. They're all over the country. I mean, mm -hmm. in other countries, if you looked it up, you'd be like, oh, they have a celebrate recovery right here. Probably in Canada, probably everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just really neat that that was a part of us. But to your point, every single time it just comes back to and I know for me, it's exactly that, just masking pain, some things I went through in my childhood, not really wanting to lay my head down at the end and just really being alone with my thoughts. So keep busy with everything else, work out, do everything, play ball. And then when it's time to really be alone with your thoughts, let's let's not do that. Let's mask it and find, find a way to numb it. Yeah. Find a way to numb it. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's yeah. so easy to fall into that trap, too. And it's hard to climb out of it. Yes, it is. It is. And it doesn't have to take what it took for me, um, but that's they say it takes what it takes. And I mean, mm. I, I've had I had a couple little things along the way. I, you know, in high school, you know, a kid pursuing this big dream. I got in trouble for drinking at a dance. Got suspended from my um, sophomore year of baseball. And you know, when when you're a kid in high school, and that's, that's the only thing you want to do, that was huge. Yeah. So you think back, like, man, if I just would have got it then and then figured out. And again, I had a dad that had been through it and was telling me daily, um, hey, bud, like, I've been there, done that, and it only ends bad, mm -hmm. prison or death. And I'm like, oh, dad, you know, you got you got sober when you're 35. You got to have so much fun and yada, yada. And just, you know, everybody can try and impart that into you. and But eventually, you kind of got to walk your own journey. And unfortunately, I guess I was a knucklehead. What, why do you think it is that people – make the decision to change is it, it is it because they hit uh, they hit bottom they crash is that what does it or is there something else going on in my experience it's pain it's always mm -hmm. pain 
like something has to be painful enough for you to want to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I, I get the opportunity for sometimes to speak to kids or someone will, hey, you know, can you meet with this kid? And I said, well, does he want help? Like, does he want help? And the parents are like, well, we don't know, but we don't know what to do. And you could always kind of tell, man, saying the right things, but I don't think he's ready to change. And if we're honest, if I'm honest, it was fun going out and having and doing things like that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, just going out with the guys or the, having fun. But when you realize I don't handle that as well as some other folks, I have a brother raised in the same house, same family, same everything. We're very similar, sound alike, look alike. He can go have social drinks, have a great time. No problem. He knows when it's when it's time to shut it down, make the responsible decisions. I can't do it. I'm Frank the Tank. I don't know why. Like that Frank part, I don't know. Why. Yeah, it's like <laughs> that Thank part. You. It just feels so good when it touches your lips. And I, just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's a chemical imbalance. I personally don't know that. I really don't. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my brother. I mean, same home, same upbringing, and he's yeah. no problem. He can go have drinks. Not an issue. So it's not everybody. But mm -hmm. once you realize it's you, and every time you do it, you're just going a little further than anybody else. Now it's time to go. Okay, this this probably is not for me. And I I, I think I failed to mention, I had five years of sobriety prior to this incident. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's big. I know I, I totally glazed over that. I I had a moment in my life where I really looked back. And went okay, my son was young, um, some things, and I was like, okay, doing this. I'm like, Ugh. and I I did it also because I just become a Christian. I was like. Oh, what am I supposed to drink? You know, so it's more of like a rule follower thing and white knuckle mm -hmm. ride. And I would listen to folks sharing. They would like come in and share their story who had like, you know, backslidden or fell off the wagon, so to speak. And I'm like, how can you do that? Like, once you believe this, I don't understand. And it was, I think folks are, you know, or somewhere, somewhere was, uh, you just wait. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I did. I had five years and then had a separation from my wife. I was away from my kids a little longer than normal. And now it's like, well, let's see how grounded and rooted you are. And all those little like tricks of, yeah, I call it the enemy, but it's like, oh, you know, it's five years later, you're more mature now, you can handle it, or just don't drink this, or try it this way. And at the end of the day, there's no new tricks. It's just, it's just all those little justifications. And so, yeah, I ended up falling back off the wagon in 2004 and then kind of fighting up until that point, knowing it wasn't right, you know, just knowing, no, this is not right for me. Not, no judgment on anyone else, but it's not right for me but still making the choices. And that's a battle. And that's hard to live in your skin mm. when you're doing things, you know, you don't want to be doing. And so, mm. uh, and, and, you know, it doesn't ever go away. It's still a daily surrender. Um, you know, you can make a choice to do whatever you want today. And at the same point we talked about earlier, you're one decision away from trashing your life. You're one choice, one decision away from making your life great. Like mm. one conversation, one introduction, you know, one shift and, and you're off and running. So uh, it's just so powerful and just can't learn enough about how, how the mind works and trying to get more and more of it. Mm -hmm. I think your story also, Brandon, is a beautiful example of how um, it's all within us. We, you know, we chase things outside of ourselves. You know, you had the baseball career. Once I get there, my life will be perfect. And then you're there and that hole wasn't filled or, you know, whether it was alcoholism or, you know, I've done all, all of those things in terms of like trying to find something to, to bring joy to my life, fill that hole. And when you live in that space of when I get to this place, you never seem to be in this moment, appreciating this moment. And you never really get that joy. It's not the thing that you're chasing. It's you in this moment choosing it. And I think your story is is an extreme example of you had nothing. Doors closed and you're locked in there for five years, whatever. Everything's going on with your family and your friends and your work and all of this stuff. And you found peace and you found joy in those moments anyway. It had nothing to do with where you were or what you had. And that's that's huge. Oh, you're on mute. That that was me. Oh. <laughs> now you got to now you got to unmute at your end, Brandon. I, I was I was trying to cut down on an echo that was that was looping around, but if you hit your mm -hmm. unmute button, I think you'll be able to open it up. I'm good. I'm yeah, good now. now you're good. There you go. Okay. Yeah. I saw that it was muted and I saw you were talking. I was like, "Oh, I need to hurry and figure this out before she's done." But no, that's an awesome point. That's a very very good point. And that's how I've always kind of uh, when I go share, I, I've always just kind of said, for lack of a better analogy for me, I just had this, I call it God-shaped hole inside of me. I just stuffed everything else in it. Uh, uh, uh. And until I put the right thing in there, 
it just it, it didn't do it. And, and to your point, yeah, it's just being where your feet are and being content where you are. And not like you're not striving or trying to go get and, and achieve and all that's awesome. But like at the end of the day, when you're always chasing and chasing and chasing, you know, to your analogy about my career, it was like well, when I got drafted out of high school, okay, this is it. No, that's not it. Well, now I made it to the big leagues. That's it. No, that's not it. Well, maybe once I sign a, you know, whatever, and you just keep going and going yeah, and you're yeah. never satiated. So what a great point. Yeah. In fact, uh, what, what I keep thinking about there, I, I personally believe that there are two factors that really combined together are the determinant when it comes to success in life, having the kind of life you're looking for, or being frustrated by life, being defeated, maybe crashing and burning, whatever it might be. And I, I'll, I'll tell you what those two factors are. I think the two factors are self-confidence and social connectedness. Hmm. And the reason I say that is, first of all, I think there's a, a big component involved with self-confidence in that if we, we very often convince ourselves that we're confident. I know I did that for years. I, if you had asked me in my 20s, am I self-confident? Without hesitation, I would have said yes. Thank and as you I look back now, it. yeah. And as I look back now, I, I know I was lying to myself, let alone everybody else. I wasn't confident. I was so, I was about as far from confident as you can be. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was it was fake confidence is what it was. Sure. sure. And yeah, absolutely. If, if I had understood that's where I needed to work, I, I suspect my 20s and 30s would have been a whole lot better. I didn't know that was where I needed to work. So that's the first part. The second part, the social connectedness, I, I, I picked up in this concept from a study that was done by Sean Aker, who is one of the leading spokesmen of the positive psychology movement. He was one of the people who helped found it um, back in the early 2000s. It actually dates back to like the late 1990s. And he did a study while he was at, he did a lot of studies at Harvard. When you go to Harvard, you know, you do that, especially when you come from Texas. He was from Austin, Texas, I believe, actually. Oh, wow. No, not Austin. He was from, um, no, what, what town was he? Uh, it'll come to me. He was from another town in Texas, a famous one. And I can't remember what it is. Um, but when he was at, at uh, Harvard, he did a number of studies. One of the studies he did was this long, long study trying to find out what it takes to be successful. And he did the study primarily because he was dealing with Harvard students who were stressed to the max. You know, they're like the elite, right? They're the best of the best. But now they're up against all the rest of the best of the best. It's like being a major league pitcher. Like, oh, my God, I've been working all this time. And, oh, this is what I'm facing. It, it was that kind of a thing. So he's yeah. trying to figure out how does he help these people? How, how does he help them understand what it's going to take to succeed? So he did this whole study. It had, like, endless amounts of questions. About one-fifth of the entire school took the study. So he had a big, 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 big uh, database to work from. And he couldn't find any correlations except for one question. The one he threw in as an afterthought at the end. It was a question about social connectedness. And what he discovered is how well you are connected both in depth and breadth is 70% predictive of your success in life. And to give you an idea of how big 70% is, the correlation between smoking cigarettes and getting cancer is 44%. Hmm. This is almost wow. double that correlation. Wow. It's Amazing. massive. Absolutely. Wow. So in my mind, I combine those two factors together and I say, those are the big ones. How do you feel about yourself and how connected are you? Hmm. That's really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard it put just like that before, but that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to follow up and ask you, how do you think you were in self-confidence, particularly as you went through that era? Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking back when you mentioned being a young, you know, that kind of thing. And I feel the same way. I feel like I was cocky, but I was not confident, right? Mm -hmm. I was that kid who grew really quickly. I was bigger than everybody and could play sports. And so you get a little bit of, you know, pat on the back and it's performance based and, if you're doing well, people like, you know, that kind of thing. And so just everything was just performance based. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, just no, not self-confident, you know, um, not at all. And so um, that would lead through most of the time. And for me, especially because, again, I alluded to when you're making choices or decisions or even entertaining thoughts that, you know, aren't healthy or they're not right. It's pretty hard to be confident self-confident, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, even in the physical realm, if you're going to go compete against the best of the best and you haven't really been working out or practicing your craft, you're not going to be real self-confident. Mm -hmm. Now we're taught, and I even teach this still, sometimes you can fake it 
and you can think it hard mm -hmm. enough until it actually, you know, yeah, okay, now I am a little calmer. But you've got to have some results to go along with that, and you've got to at some point be grounded in something a little more than just, yeah, I'm going to get this guy out. I'm ready. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I like you all. I don't ever feel like, um, you know, even now. I mean, I'm late 40s and, and doing a little better, and it's like self-confidence sometimes, but still like pretty, you know, <laughs> scared to my own skin, imposter syndrome. Well, who wants to read my stuff? Why is my story important? Why, you know, I didn't ask for this call. I don't get it, you know. So I, I certainly haven't turned my tassel in that arena. I mean, there's some things I'm somewhat confident in. But I still just, you know, at the end of the day and when I'm alone in my own thoughts, it's still, oh, are you good enough? Can you handle this? You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think it's just a work in progress. I think it is for all of us. So, but it has to lead to a question. What do you think it takes to build self-confidence? Oh, that's a big one. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, OK, I'll just go with kind of what I just alluded to for me. Whatever my, you know. I guess I don't know, standards, the right word, but my moral compass, things of that nature. I think for me, I have to be at least trying to go in the right direction with my decisions, my thought process, the way I'm treating people. Um, and I don't know, this could be total counter, you know, intuitive to what we see, because I know some people can just walk all over people, at least they seem confident. But if I'm not kind of dialed into what I I have feel or been brought up to, to think. And again, sometimes that gets exposed for different reasons, but it's like, then I, I'm not very confident. Um, I, if I'm acting out, if the, if my thoughts and how I'm treating people, my actions are lining up with who I say I am or who I want to be, then I have confidence when they're not rather than just thought or indeed or whatever it is, then I know, cause you can't trick yourself. You, you can trick a lot of mm -hmm, other people and walk right. around really confident, but when it really comes down to, Hey, mm -hmm. you guy in the mirror, where are you at right now? Yeah. Um, if those things aren't lining up, I'm not confident. That's my that's best way of looking at it. I like that. That was good. I, I, when I think about self confidence, I think also in terms of self love, self esteem, self consideration, self care. I mean, they all kind of overlap. The whole that, to me, self confidence is like the umbrella that covers all of them. Mm -hmm. it, it, it includes all that stuff. And, and I think it's acceptance of yourself as well, like right where you yes, are right in this moment. How much can you love yourself just the way that you are? Yeah, that's, awesome. that's a huge one. That's yeah. basically knowing the deep inner you. Yeah. The real you. And that's not easy. <laughs> no, it takes practice. Yeah. Yes. That's what the guru is called becoming enlightened. That's where you actually know who that inner being is. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Ironically, I just started a new book today. Um, Think Like a Monk by Sheedy. Okay. Um, and it, that was exactly what it was all about. It was yeah. just kind of enlightenment and kind of finding your inner peace and so this in like meditation and breathing and all the stuff we've heard of, but just another angle on it of someone who went through it. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was saying. And until you, you know, can really find yourself and love it. I mean, here's a guy that went successful, went to college, was going to be a lawyer, doctor from Indian descent. So his parents were like, Boom, boom, boom. And he's like, no, I'm going to be a monk for three years. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. And he's back in the world and doing great things. He's, he's in the space of, you know, encouraging and self-help and all that. But um, that's where he found, you know, more so than any of the formal education or anything else is where he became, quote, unquote, enlightened and, and kind of found out how to love himself so he can love better. And I was like, yeah. wow. So that's just a common theme today or, or really quite often. But that, that really that, that popped up is ironic. Oh, well, that's law of attraction as far as I'm concerned. I mean, yeah, just, I mean, that's, yeah, just that's, that's a better term for it, right? <laughs> yeah, and I attracted absolutely. it too. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I think it's really true. It's, I, yeah. I'm glad we were talking about this and I'm glad we kind of got to this. I'm not really quite sure how we did, but I really do believe this, this self-love, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-acceptance, self-appreciation, um, self-care, yeah. giving cutting self slack that whole thing is yeah. it, it's the biggest piece of all the social connectedness is huge obviously for the reason that i gave but i think almost the self-confidence the self-love that piece is even bigger because yeah. that's actually what leads to the social connectedness i was gonna say don't the two kind of go hand in hand because they when do. you're feeling confident and feeling good you feel good about your interaction and your yeah. social connectedness when you're not you tend to back off and want to go into a little bit of a hole and not be around people. And I know, especially in recovery circles, 
that's the number one sign when they stop reaching out it's like uh oh mm. uh oh yeah. that connection is not there alarm bells. alarm bells we know what's going on yeah 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 absolutely mm -hmm. it's so interesting at the the human psyche how we have this need to like be perfect and cover up the difficult stuff that we're going through you know i can't show anybody that so we begin to retreat and that's when we need our circle, the people who love us, like that compassion, that support so much more is in that moment. And we do the opposite. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like you're only as sick as your secrets, but again, <laughs> you don't really want to let people know it's hard. It's a really hard thing to do. It really is. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard too, because in order to be um, transparent enough for others, we have to first be transparent enough for ourselves. And, and that's almost harder. Mm -hmm. I think it's harder because well, this is something we mentioned a lot. We beat ourselves up better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. we're, we're really, really rough on ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, or the way I often like to say it is if we treated our friends the way we treat ourselves, we wouldn't have any friends. <laughs> that's true. Right? Yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. we're just, we're just <laughs> awful to ourselves. Yes. Uh, uh, probably the best thing we can learn to do is to learn to be kinder to ourselves. As often as possible. Yeah. That's big. I love that. I love that. I think that's a one you hear and then you kind of move past. And it's like today I'm really trying to go, okay, I love that point wall. And I really want to implement this in my life, like immediately Yeah, <laughs> and continue it. You know what I mean? I think there's going to be times where you fall out of it. And it goes back to that good self-talk. Right. And mm -hmm. I mean, we do affirmations and um, I say, we, I have, I have my, my manager slash uh, girlfriend here next to me. And, and so she ah. always tells me, she's like, your power is your presence. Your power yeah. is your yeah. presence. And from the first time I ever saw you that, and I'm like, really? And so you kind of walk <laughs> in like, not again, not arrogant, but like, okay, I see that. Yeah. Maybe people <sighs> love attraction. They are when you're confident and smiling and people are attracted to that. And so um, those affirmations are just huge. Cause mm -hmm. it goes back to like, are you, are you listening to yourself or talking to yourself? If we're not putting the right thoughts in, as we know, the thoughts aren't going to stop coming. They'll keep coming, and they're not going to be the ones that we need to really uh, entertain. Mm -hmm. True enough. Yeah. Jo Jody, we always have the, the, the conversation, like, you know, how is this show doing? How, how is this particular conversation going? I don't know about you. I didn't really expect it to go this way, but I think this one's pretty darn good. I love it. I I, I think that we're touching on a lot of really important things right now. And I think I love that your vulnerability and I a hundred percent agree with your girlfriend. You know, there is the power in your presence and you have this larger than life presence. Yes. Just even online. And uh, it's just, Thanks. it's beautiful. This conversation has been wonderful. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I think your book is going to be very healing for, you know, a lot of people. So over the next time you, you know, have that thought of like, who wants to read this? Uh, I do. <laughs> I think a lot of people do. We got one. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. I really appreciate that. It's so great to, to be encouraged and um, to hear those words of affirmation is, is important. So thank you for that. And uh, just to pile on a little bit more, I want to also add, well, first of all, I want to recognize, uh, we, we didn't really name your organization, GPS Legends. The GPS Legends, yes, sir. Yeah. Did, you ask, did you ask how we named it? Is that well, I, I was bringing it up just to give you a chance to tell us a little bit about oh, it before we run out of time. Yeah, it, I mean, it's my passion project. It's what I love to do. And, and I'll just, I'll, I'll be quick because I know we'll be respectful of time. But essentially, I share with you guys when I was locked away, when I was in prison, it was like, Baseball may or may not be a part of my life, but I've given so much to it, but who knows? Okay, it was a good ride. And I took a very, um, I guess, humbling job at the stadium in Round Rock. There's a triple-A stadium. The, uh, Nolan Ryan and his family own it, and they were very instrumental in my thing. Uh, Nolan came as a character witness to my trial. But anyway, uh, his son, Reed, was, man, was the owner. So when you come out, come see us, and we'll take care of you. What that meant was, humble yourself. We have nothing, but we have a maintenance job. I'll do it. And I'll paint and I'll stain. I can't fix anything, but I'll do whatever. <laughs> and I just, it was so like, I would see the guys on the field and I was always happy. And again, they're like, you used to pitch out there. How can you be happy like working in the bathroom? I'm like, because it's awesome. I'm at the stadium. And, and mm -hmm. slowly but surely, I used to give private pitching instructions. A couple families reached out and said, hey, do you want to do lessons again? And, and right away, it was the imposter. It was like, who would want me to do that anymore? Sure. Yeah, I'll do it. One or two. Anyway, long story short. They promoted me to baseball outreach coordinator for for uh, Round Rock, 
and I started a couple teams and then my partner and I took a leap of faith because it went grew pretty fast and we instead of kind of coattailing you know the Ryans and what an amazing baseball family but we just kind of wanted our own legacy and so we we jumped out in a leap of faith and started a GPS um, at the time it was GPS Texas baseball um, and it's God provides strength and it was also we we were kind of coming up with like a slow we're like what do we do we help kids find their directions we're like oh a GPS mm, yeah, yeah. and then my partner's name was Brian Gordon he pitched for the Yankees and it was Gordon Puffer Select so there's all these things and then um, eventually the youth part of it became very, very draining. My sweet spot is the high school kids recruiting, helping them, talking to them, like, the, the youth stuff. I love the kids, but like coaching and the parents, to be honest with you, were really hard. So we, we, uh, joined together with my good buddy, Matt Hartgrove, who had a youth program called the legends. And so he, he kind of oversees 13 and under, I oversee 14 and up. And we kind of made nice. the combination GPS legends. Yeah. So it's cool. We yeah, we get to just kind of like I said, pour into kids and and um, you know pass on lessons. But I mean, more than anything, it's like yeah, the baseball stuff's great. But here's what else I've been through, and let me try to help you become a better man, basically. Really, really good. Yeah, well, I got to cool. tell you, I, um, I know that this is not something you've likely heard much before, but I want to make sure you hear it on behalf of all the people who have heard of you, but you'll, you've never met them and you'll never meet them. You'll never see them, but they've heard your message. They've heard your story in some way. They've read something that you wrote, something like that on behalf of them. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for reaching out, telling your story, sharing, being vulnerable in that way and helping in that way to be a role model, to be the person that they really want to be. So thank you on their behalf. Oh, thank you for that. Well, that, that encourages me to, to keep going and keep sharing and keep telling it. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Beautiful thing. I love that. Jody, I think we hit a home run. I agree. <laughs> That's a good pun. <laughs> if you're going to hit a home run, you might as well hit it off a major league pitcher, right? I, mean, I, gave, I gave up party of them, believe me. <laughs> and it was a real dinger, let me tell you. Yeah. So thank you very much. Appreciate your, your yeah. time and effort and energy, Brand. Awesome. Jody, as, as usual, it's been wonderful. And thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.